I just want to reflect a little bit on what what has been said. And, you know, one thing, um, you know, February 24th, the day that Russia uh, began its military operations in Ukraine, I think uh, will be will be remembered for many reasons. And I think one is uh, that it, it's a sign that the West is in decay. Um, and, you know, as the kind of the war in Ukraine kind of uh, drags on, um, you know, and there's this kind of push for more NATO aggression and expansion, um, we kind of inch closer and closer to nuclear war. And I think nuclear war has always been the end of history, uh, the end of history for the idea of Europe, because let's let's be honest, Europe is a peninsula of Asia. Europe is an idea, right? And many of these kind of, it, it doesn't, we can talk about capitalism and kind of the imperialist wars that have been fought, but I also think that underlying a lot of this is, is this, uh, this idea of kind of a European centrism uh, or Eurocentrism uh, that Samir Amin, you know, coined. But um, I think what at the heart of it, it's like it is, you know, it's a year. This is a European civil war that they're trying to drag the rest of the world into um, and raising kind of the the level of, uh, of nuclear warfare um, puts not only Europe in danger, but the rest of the planet in danger. But it also has done this It has, you know, been a gift uh, to many of these, uh, you know, so-called like humanitarian groups who want to ignore uh, U.S. wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and the bombing of, you know, African countries, um, the the continued uh, U.S.-backed war in, in Yemen uh, that's led by Saudi Arabia, who's using U.S. weapons to essentially, you know, kill hundreds of thousands of people, uh, the U.S. intervention in Syria, um, that led to the deaths of over, you know, half a million and the displacement of, of millions of others. Um, and so I think like from an indigenous perspective, you know, we can look at the, dip the diplomacy of the United States as being one of only a hammer, right? And if all you have is a hammer, then everything is going to look like a nail. And I think it really does, you know, like if we look at the context of Ukraine and the way that the United States fueled this uh, ethno nationalism um, and, you know, look, you know, I think Onye brought up a really good point about this kind of post Soviet uh, era where, you know, it's not to say that the Soviet Union was this kind of like utopic place, but nonetheless, it was it was a balance between different ethnicities in that country where like plurality could exist and flourish. Whereas, you know, when the United States intervened in 2014 and helped topple the government, it was like they were trying to implement implement a homogenous, you know, Ukrainian nationalist uh, idea, which didn't allow for um, what we would promote as plurinationalism. So I think this idea that indigenous people or colonized people uh, the world over should be supporting this quote unquote decolonization attempt on, on behalf of Ukraine completely ignores how this is really just European uh, uh, a chauvinism at the end of the day and is really kind of pushing this white supremacist agenda where you have, you know, dozens of uh, so far you have dozens of uh, people from the United States joining these right wing militias and being empowered by uh, the the kind of flood of weapon weaponry that's going into there. And then also you have like uh, news organizations like NPR that are platforming, um, you know, as of battalion um, and saying like, yeah, it's just, oh, you're just joining a, a Nazi militia or uh, there was I can't remember his name, but there was a, a mayor of a town. He was being interviewed by NPR NewsHour, and he literally had a picture of Bandera, the, the the Nazi collaborator, in the background. And it reminded me of you know how Trump you know invited Navajo code talkers to to Washington uh, to the White House, and then had a picture of Andrew Jackson hanging hanging in the background. Right? It's a very clear sign that that these are not you know uh, people that you would really want to be allying with, let alone um, you know indigenous folks uh, supporting or colonized people uh, supporting. Um, but I also think, you know, one of the things that isn't really, you know, being talked about here in the in the West is how the ruling class, how the oligarchs, right, whether the pet, you have the petro oligarchs uh, or you have the green oligarchs like Elon Musk are rallying behind um, this kind of NATO backed war effort and sanctions regime to essentially develop domestic energy supplies. And I think there, you know, there was mainstream environmentalists who are saying, let's use the crisis uh, with with Ukraine as an opportunity to move towards a green technology. Others were saying, let's use the crisis of Ukraine to, to really uh, push forward, uh, you know, nuclear power in the United States to get our energy grids off this, this dirty energy. 
Um, and I think it's really fascinating to me because, you know, the, the day before uh, Biden made his famous speech condemning Putin for the invasion of Ukraine, he was he was speaking to a group of uh, multinational mining firms about developing U.S. domestic energy uh, for green technology, for developing lithium supplies, for developing copper supplies. And so at the end of the day, it's like the only options that the United States has in this moment to like when it when it comes to energy and energy uh, independence is colonial capitalist extraction, because you know, you have Rio Tinto, um, uh, an Australian mining firm going into a place like Oak Flat, you know, which is an Apache, San Carlos Apache sacred site to develop, uh, you know, copper ore, to extract copper ore, to meet the energy demands of the United States and to meet Joe Biden's call for energy independence and electrifying the federal fleet. You also have the Thacker Pass, which is, you know, uh, slotted to be one of the largest open pit lithium mines um, for rechargeable batteries that is also, you know, targeting uh, northern Paiute lands for, for destruction. And that doesn't even get into the, the long battle that uh, indigenous peoples, indigenous movements have waged against the fossil fuel industry and in challenging a quarter of carbon emissions from Canada and the United States, which equals to about 1.8 million tons of carbon. Uh, from being emitted that's what indigenous movements have stopped and now you know the capitalists whether they're green uh imperialists or whether they're petro imperialists are seeing this moment as a moment in time to wage another economic another political war against indigenous sovereignty in in north america and we should we should be very you know we should take that um very that threat very seriously that these are the repercussions of sanctions that these are the repercussions of um you know, economic war against civilian populations in places like Russia. We only have to look to a, a country like Venezuela to understand that when Obama implemented the harshest economic sanctions against Venezuela, it was around the time that, you know, crude energy or crude uh, oil prices dropped in, in 2014. None of those, those sanctions have been repealed, but they targeted uh, specifically Venezuela's oil and gas infrastructure. And what was happening at that time? You know, it, we had the fracking revolution in the United States. We had Obama's all of the above energy policy, which which pushed for domestic uh, development of oil and gas. That's why we had the Dakota Access Pipeline. So we have to understand that these things, that indigenous peoples, uh, you know, water protectors who are fighting oil and gas uh, infrastructure are also part of it, should be thinking about themselves uh, as part of an anti-imperialist struggle against U.S. global hegemony when it comes to the fossil fuel industry. And now it's coming down to the green, the green tech, the green tech industry as well. Um, 